we need a bigger lecture theatre. Yeah. I assume we can't let people sit on the stairs. <coughs> Health and safety. Two, two ladies and gentlemen that are still standing on the stairs if you make you too if you make your way back out you'll be shown to the overflow room thank you so i've been told to wait until the doors close and then i'm allowed to speak <laughs> they're almost closed so welcome everybody. This is what it feels like to be in the spotlight. Luckily I'm only here for a couple of minutes. Toby will have to take the strain instead. I'm really pleased to welcome you all here. Um, I'm Michelle Doherty. I'm the head of department. I'm so pleased that you're here to help us celebrate Toby's promotion to professor in theoretical physics. Um, I got a bit of information on Toby. I'm not going to give it all away, Toby, I promise. But he came to Imperial as a new lecturer from, um, in 2006. Um, and he was also an STFC advanced fellow. And this was in the theory group. He received his undergraduate degree from Cambridge. And he followed with his PhD there as well. And this was in gravity and cosmology with Neil with Neil Torrick, and he then worked in Stephen Hawking's group as a research fellow for a while, before going to Harvard on a postdoc position for three years. And we were then very fortunate that he decided when he came back to the UK to come to Imperial. Um, we're really very proud of his high profile research, um, but also of the wonderful teaching that he does. He's received many teaching awards as a result of the teaching that he does. Before I give the floor to Toby, there's a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if, the, if a fire alarm goes off, we weren't planning any tests, so if one goes off, it means that we need to leave. And if you could follow the exit signs and we convene on Prince Consort Road, if we need to do that, because it's so cold out there, I certainly hope we aren't going to have to do that. Um, I'm nursing a hamstring injury at the moment, so I can't actually sit. So I'm going to go and stand at the back of the room. I promise I'm not deserting Toby. I will come back down at the end, but I'll be standing at the back of the room. So with that, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Toby Wiseman to tell us about space and time, a modern perspective. Toby. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So firstly, um, it's a real honor to be able to give this lecture. It's a lovely opportunity to talk to people about physics, but also friends and family and so on. Um, it's not an opportunity to talk to you about space and time from uh, a modern perspective. And so I'll, I'll talk about some classical ideas and, and bring you up to date uh, with some of the things we're thinking about currently in the, in the research world. We'll start with the Newton and the classical perspectives on space and time. We'll move through to special relativity, quantum mechanics, what they say about it. We'll then discuss general relativity, which is Einstein's theory of gravity. Um, and then we'll move beyond to a more 
uh, speculative part of the talk where I talk about some more advanced ideas really from the last 20 years or so. But before I start, um, I need to say some thank yous. We don't often get a chance to say thank yous. Uh, so <laughs> I have no idea what would happen if I don't. So I'm going to say them at the beginning <laughs> rather than wait till the end and possibly forget. Uh, now, the first thank you, of course, goes to the department for putting on this event uh, and uh, being very supportive. And it's a wonderful department, the physics department, to be in. Uh, it's, I have fabulous colleagues. We do, there's all sorts of wonderful physics that goes on here. Uh, Michelle, for example, is involved in uh, one of the lead scientists in the Cassini mission. You may have seen all of the wonderful results they had recently in the news. And there's all sorts of stuff going on in the department. It's a really great place to be. And my group, the theoretical physics group, which thinks basically about the fundamental laws of nature and what they imply, what we can learn about basic physics from those, uh, is a fabulous group to be in. It's a really, really great group. I have wonderful colleagues, very supportive very nice people, all brilliant scientists, and I have great fun discussing, debating, disagreeing, and learning in the end from, from them. So that's really been fantastic. Um, I must also thank all my collaborators, some of whom are here. And uh, again, thank you for collaborating with me. I've had an awful lot of fun. Harry Horowitz, who will give the vote of thanks later, actually has come all the way from California. Why you would leave California, I don't know. It's a lovely place, but he has, and so thank you. And Gary's been very supportive of my career, but also I've been very influenced by the science that Gary has done and many of the things that he thought about, I've subsequently thought about after. So uh, one way or the other uh, has been a strong influence on me. I also, of course, now have to thank my family, my wonderful family. My, uh, my father unfortunately passed away a few years back, but would have been very proud, and my mom is very proud. Um, <laughs> she'll be asking difficult questions later, I'm quite sure. Um, and uh, my I think, look up at the stars, not at your feet. Um, my wife still there, and um, they're terrible. I've said the thank yous I should be saying. Now, talking of my collaborators, I remember, uh, or springs to mind, uh, a wonderful physicist, Shiraz Minwala, an Indian physicist who, uh, again, influenced me very strongly. He was faculty in Harvard when I was a postdoc there. And um, he said to me when I was going off to give a talk about our work once, bamboozle them. And if you know Shiraz Minwala, you have some sense of what a bamboozling looks like. And if you don't, I suspect you will learn what a bamboozling looks like in the next 40 minutes or so. So we're now going to start with the classical uh, era of space time. Uh, I played guitar not terribly well uh, in my youth. Uh, this is a lute, obviously uh, uh, the precursor to the guitar. And uh, really, all great things uh, in thought start, in some sense, with the Greeks. The idea of a continuum. Now, time, uh, it's rather natural, at least we think today, to think of time from a as a continuum that we talk about a flow of time. And space, of course, we understand intuitively as a continuum. And it was the Greeks who really started thinking. And in fact, this is, you know, um, Zeno worried about whether motion was real because of the properties of the continuum. This is Zeno. He's on a Corinthian column and wants to move over here to this nice. Uh, he decides, but not in one go, but he moves halfway across. Then he removes, uh, moves the remaining uh, half, uh, half the remaining distance, half the remaining distance. And because it seemingly is going to take him an infinite number of steps, he worries deeply about whether one can move from one place to another. The continuum is lim linked to notions of infinity, and how do you deal with notions of infinity? Now, these issues were we can move around, uh, resolved by, uh, in part, Descartes. Uh, Descartes uh, introduced coordinates. He understood that 
space and time could be understood by real numbers. Uh, to measure, say, a distance, we're, we're using the Cartesian ideas, a very profound step. Before that, geometry and space and numbers were just completely separate subjects. So in that step, uh, Descartes made a very profound change in the way we understand our world, uh, the world around us. Motion in this continuum space. So he's using these ideas of Descartes, the ideas of coordinates to describe space, let's say x, y, and z, um, and then a particle or some object like this rocket, uh, we understand has a definite trajectory through space and time, governed uh, mathematically as the change in those coordinates as time progresses. And in Newton's idea, It's in time. And so there's certainly an absolute notion. And it's a deterministic object, your particle, your rocket, and you know the forces that act on it, the mass. He writes down F equals MA, and that tells you, using his calculus, precisely what the trajectory will be at any later time. And this was a very deep realization. So remember, not that long before, the notion that space could be described by numbers wasn't even there. And now Newton had described mechanics in a simple equation, albeit having had to invent calculus to do it. This is the realization that the universe is mathematical at its most fundamental level. Now, why that is the case, no one has any idea. I I certainly don't, and I don't believe anyone else has a sensible idea on it, but it is fact. And that essentially was the start of fundamental theoretical physics. The idea being that we are revealing, not, not inventing new mathematics, we're revealing existing mathematics. The laws that govern our universe have this mathematical structure, and we're trying to uncover them and understand that mathematics. And that's a very profound thing. I mean, it's very difficult to overstate the importance of Newton in the development of modern uh, understanding of the world. Now, this is um, Django Reinhardt. I remember uh, this music on long car journeys as a kid. So now, he was playing in the early 1900s. We're now going to move on to the era of what we might call modern physics. Not very modern, but modern versus classical. And we have special relativity and quantum mechanics. So firstly, we have special It's a remarkable theory. Einstein said in 1905, everyone agrees with the speed of light. Nothing travels faster than it. And we call the speed of light C. It's sort of like the universal speed limit. It's roughly a billion miles now. Pretty close to a, a billion kilometers now, but it's roughly a billion miles now. The fact it's finite was understood in Newton's time there were experiments looking at the moons of Jupiter, which determined the speed of light pretty accurately. And that's astonishing. However, what Einstein said was that everyone agrees on the speed. It be the same. And that is a very counterintuitive and deep statement. Why? Supposing we have, um, we're going on the motorway, and we look at a car traveling next to us. It's got a very small relative velocity, and that's why motorways work, generally. <laughs> Supposing we're on an A road and we have a car moving the opposite direction, we have a very high relative velocity, roughly 120 miles an hour, and that's why they invented central reservations. <laughs> now, supposing we're on a road and um, a beam of light flies past, and we measure its speed relative to us, and then later in the journey, a beam of light overtakes us. Of course, we would measure that speed relative to us to differ by 120 miles an hour. It'd be a very high speed, but you would expect to get a different answer in both cases. And of course, that's not what happens. What Einstein said, in both cases, you'll measure exactly the same speed relative to you. So something has to give. There's something wrong. And what gives is this notion that distance, space, and time are absolute. 
In Einstein's way of thinking, the speed of light is the absolute. And because speed is distance over time, space and time become inextricably linked into something we call space-time. It is absolute in the sense it's the collection of all events that are possible, an event being a point at a given time. However, the coordinates we use to label events no longer have physical meaning. And different observers moving in different ways will try and put different labels onto the same events. But those labels, that's okay, those labels don't matter, they're not really physical. And everything always conspires so that when anyone measures this speed of light, they do get the same answer. But in particular, the distances, well, the times, let's, let's focus on time, the times that observers measure really aren't to do with these labels, they're really to do with the trajectory through space and time that you take. So we talk about a space-time diagram. These are all the events. Now this, this is a, a story of two people coming to this lecture. Um, I'm going to use the label for time, Greenwich Mean Time, and I'm going to use the label for space, latitude and longitude, for example. And this is one event. So this is Greenwich Mean Time. This is Imperial College at uh, 525 Greenwich Mean Time, according to <laughs> some observer. Uh, anyway, then, there's a technical point there. Uh, then, uh, these two characters uh, walk from this event to this event, a lecture, one following this trajectory, uh, where they start off, very sensibly look at their map, and then proceed in an orderly manner. And this other character here, who is pretty sure they know where they're going, <laughs> proceeds, realizes they have no clue where they are, look at their phone, and thank goodness we've got phones that with GPS, rushes to get to the same event. Of course, Newton would say they experienced 25 minutes to have elapsed. Uh, Einstein says, no, time, this time is just a label. It's got really not, it's not directly related to what it, they experience. And what they experience is what we call the proper time. It's really measured in, it, by the length of this trajectory through space and time. One has to be a bit careful about how you define length, but there's, it, it's essentially a length of this trajectory. And for that reason, these two people will experience a different time to have elapsed. It's a very small effect when you walk from South Kent Tube to here. But if you happen to travel very fast, it would become a large effect. And in fact, it's a perfectly measurable effect. Ironically, it's important in the GPS system that this character here used to find Imperial, uh, because you've got atomic clocks in space that are moving fast, and so the time they experience is different to the time that an atomic clock sitting on Earth experiences. I think it's uh, not commonly known that time travel is possible. This is time travel. So we have uh, uh, two twins, an adventurous one and a, and a less adventurous one. The adventurous one gets in a very fast rocket, flies off, flies back. Because they've taken a different trajectory, a different time is lapsed, and it turns out the way it goes is the adventurous one ages less. Less time is elapsed for them when they return and meet again. So being adventurous literally keeps you young in this sense. It's really true. This isn't the sort of time travel where you can go back, kill your great, 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 great grandparent and see what happens. But this is, this is not, nonetheless time travel into the future. Now we come on to quantum mechanics. Now quantum mechanics I can only touch on because it's a very peculiar and bizarre subject, but nonetheless it is the way the world works. Um, I'm going to focus on its, its, the aspect of it relevant Point being that Newton's laws are not really fundamentally true. They're approximately true, um, but on small scales, at the quantum scale, really what is true is quantum mechanics. It doesn't deeply change our notion of the underlying space and time, but what it does deeply change is the way we measure where objects are and indeed how well we can measure them. You may be wondering, this is Schrodinger, and this is his cat, and this is the wave function. And instead of having uh, a classical trajectory where we definitely know where this is, everything's deterministic, if we know at some time, we know every, every time later. Uh, we, can, we can precisely describe the probability of it being in different locations, but we have to measure it to know where now, you can not like that, but that seems to be the way it works. 
it for lots of time, but there isn't a, a counter-proposal that seems to actually uh, be how reality is. There's a fundamental constant called h bar. I hope you can see it's an h with a slash through, so we call it h bar, which describes when quantum mechanics becomes important. And in particular, it governs how well we can know where an object is. And in a theory of uh, relativity, we have a fundamental takes this form, that the best we can know it is given by this expression here. There will be some equations, I warn you. I should have warned you at the beginning. Uh, it depends on the mass of the object and then this quantity here and, of course, the speed of light because it's a relativistic theory. Now, fortunately, because you are all very massive, and I mean that in a nice way, uh, you know pretty well where you are, and this uncertainty is not an issue. But if you happen to be a very small object, like an electron here, orbiting around a proton, so essentially a hydrogen atom, you're very light, and this becomes uh, an important uncertainty. So the wrong picture of an atom is that it's an electron whizzing around a proton. The right picture of an atom is that the proton electrically attracts the electron to it. And wants to basically have it in exactly the same place. But it can't achieve that because it would violate this uncertainty in where the electron is. Because we can't know precisely where it is, actually what happens is the electron gets us, it, it's puffed out into a probability distribution that's squashed pretty much as much as the proton can squash it. And that is what determines the size of an atom. So this physics here, while not relevant for us, is essentially what determines the sizes of atoms and therefore us. So it's very important, uh, very important physics. So where are we now uh, in our bamboozling? The, the space-time is a collection of all events. It, it remains absolute at this point. It's a sort of stage. Space-time coordinates just label the events. Time and space that we perceive depend on our trajectory and interact with that space-time. And the position of an object is fundamentally uncertain due to quantum mechanics. And over the decades since the uh, early 1900s, uh, special relativity and quantum mechanics were combined into our modern understanding of matter. And if we leave gravity aside, we really understand tremendously well how quantum matter works. And you can literally write down on a t-shirt the description of all of the forces of nature and all of the particles that we know, excluding gravity. And it's called the standard model of particle physics. It's tested exquisitely at places like CERN. No one has found any deviations of it. It makes incredible predictions, predictions up to you know, many, many decimal places, and you can test them, and they're true. It's an amazing theory. The terrible thing about it is its name. Uh, the standard model is probably the most boring name that could be given to what is probably one of the most remarkable things that we know. Uh, and again, it reflects the idea that the fundamental laws governing everything seem to be mathematical. Now, on to gravity. What's gravity got to say about space? It's a force. How does it change any of this? According to Newton, you've all seen this, uh, this force law of gravity. Uh, there are some very young members of the audience who will see it shortly. Everyone else has seen it, either know it very well or has forgotten it long ago. Uh, here, this, this fundamental constant G, G for gravity, I guess, uh, is the fundamental constant that tells you when, essentially, gravity becomes important. This is very old physics, so, uh, however, there are some peculiarities with it. One of them is that the force seemingly acts instantaneously. So if I have an object exerting a force on another object and I move it quickly, the force will change quickly and instantaneously. And Einstein had said nothing travels faster than the speed of light, including the information that this object had moved. So how could that be true? Galileo also observed a little before that all objects, if there's no other force acting on them than gravity, fall the same way. So if we have Galileo and he drops a cannonball and a feather, excluding air resistance, they would hit the ground at the same time. And they really do, by the way. Um, now, to most people, they would just go, hmm, well, that's, how, that's Newton's law, yeah, let's go. But to Einstein, who was a peculiarly deep thinker, I mean, uh, I, it, it is actually astonishing uh, what he did, and this was in 1915, 
he realized these two little facts that you wouldn't think are too severe uh, really meant that the whole of Newton's theory of gravity was wrong and it needed to be radically overhauled. And he did this by saying there is no force of gravity at all. Instead, space and time aren't what we think. They are not what we call flat. So he agrees with Newton. He says, we move in a straight line if there's no force acting on us. But he disagrees with Newton that gravity is not a force and that that straight line is a straight line in a curved space-time. Now, if you're falling near the Earth, there's no, and ignoring air resistance or other forces, only gravity is acting. So Einstein would say there's no force of gravity. You are following a straight line, but in a curved space-time. And because all objects follow a straight line, it's a straight line, it's a straight line, a straight line, this is why all objects fall the same way. That explains Galileo's observation immediately. It's difficult, I find it difficult, I suspect many people do, to comprehend what a curved space-time means and moving in a straight line in it, sort of intuitively. I like to think of it this way. It's easy to understand a straight line and a curved space, fortunately. We all walk around on the surface of the Earth, which, as we know, uh, nearly everyone knows, is round. Um, <laughs> And so you've probably never thought about it, but you intuitively understand what a straight line is in a curved geometry. If we have Newton and Galileo at the North Pole here, oops, and they both uh, decide to move in straight lines but in different directions, but at the same speed, eventually they will land, land up after their travels at the South Pole. This is entirely unsurprising. However, if they didn't realize the Earth was round, this would come as really quite a surprise. They started off at the same place, moved in straight lines in different directions, but eventually met again. And they would conclude there was some force of attraction pulling them together. And that would be the Newton view of gravity. But of course, Einstein says there's no force. You're just moving in a curved space-time. So how does that work? So Einstein, in more detail, says something like the sun bends space and time around it. And then the Earth follows a straight line in space-time and because it's, it's a straight line in a bent space, that results in orbital motion. And it reproduces very much what Newton said a force of gravity would do, although in detail, even within the solar system, even in the 1800s, it was realized there, was, there were small deviations from what Newton predicted. And of course, this has now been tested very accurately, and those deviations are exactly what Einstein's theory does predict uh, you would see. They are the differences from Newton's theory. So it's very, very, I mean, it really is true. Einstein is correct. Again, this notion of a, a mathematical universe, Einstein could write down in a single equation um, what the law of bending of space-time is. He wrote down this beautiful equation it's called the Einstein equation. The left-hand side describes the, the curvature of space and time at a point, <laughs> and the right-hand side, do you want me to? Oh, really? Oh, oh OK. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> um, cheers. Uh, the the, the left-hand side is the space-time curvature. The right-hand side, this object T here, describes the matter within the space-time. Um, these constants here are the same constants we met before. But it's a beautifully simple relation. The way this curving works is, is wonderfully simple. And it has some huge consequences when you go beyond sort of solar system gravitational physics. So let's explore those. So firstly, space-time is dynamical. So not only does space-time bend in response to matter within it, but even if you remove this matter over here and we're in vacuum, this equation here still has dynamics. It's very much similar to the surface of a pond. If you disturb the surface of a pond, you set up ripples which then travel. Even when the disturbance is removed, the ripples carry on. The surface of a pond is dynamical. Space and time is exactly the same. If you're fidgeting, looking at your watch, saying, oh, this is all nonsense. When's it going to end? You are disturbing not least space and time, but because you are uh, not very massive in this sense now, and I mean, again, that in a nice way, uh, and not moving very fast, not capable of moving terribly fast, you don't disturb space-time very much. 
On the other hand, if you get two massive objects that really can move fast, it can disturb space-time a lot and send out ripples that then travel at the speed of light. And the remarkable, you probably saw, you may have seen in the news a, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, remarkably for the first time, these uh, ripples were discovered. They were seen by a, basically a space-time ripple detector in America called LIGO, uh, and they originated from two whopping great black holes, each something like 30 times the mass of the sun, colliding with each other. And in that collision, a huge amount of uh, ripples were sent off. They traveled for a billion years, reached our detector, and we saw them. And so this, I mean, this is remarkable physics, remarkable experiments, and it's true. Space and time is dynamical. So we shouldn't think of space and time as some absolute stage. It's really a dynamical entity. It's part of the play. It's an actor in the play. Now, what about black holes? Black holes are remarkable objects, again, predicted by uh, general relativity. If we pack enough matter into a small region, it will bend space-time so much that in the end, it sort of tears it. And the tear is surrounded by uh, a surface, a sphere of no return called the event horizon. Um, it's the point where if you go inside that sphere, you will never return. Even light can't escape the strong curvature or pull, if you like, of the space-time. Now, it's, a, it's very similar, for example, to a duck in a, in a river. This river is flowing faster and faster towards this colossal waterfall. Uh, and provided the duck stays upstream in the slow portion of the river, the duck's perfectly fine, nothing to worry about whatsoever. However, should the duck stray, <coughs> Uh, over that line, the duck is inevitably swept to uh, a sticky end. And a black hole horizon is exactly like this. Um, the size of the horizon is given by its mass. This is, this is obviously myself and my uh, wonderful students, uh, Cry and Lucas. And uh, the other day, a black hole uh, came into our office. Uh, we're all okay. Uh, you can't see that they are okay. Uh, now, in fact, you can't see a black hole, of course, because no light comes from it, so it's black when you look at it, the absence of light. Uh, however, you can see that it distorts the light rays passing by it as they pass through this curved space-time. You can see it quite clearly in my office here. Uh, the, the size of the event horizon is related to the mass of the black hole in this way. The bigger the mass, the bigger the size. Something like the sun, if it collapsed to a black hole, would be kilometers across. Um, this is probably the mass of Jupiter, so we actually did very well uh, not to fall in, not to be pulled in by its incredibly strong gravity. In fact, the whole of uh, South Kensington did very well uh, not to uh, collapse in. Had we fallen in, we would have found that after a finite time, we would be crushed to death. Uh, we would have been squashed to zero size, infinite density, in what is called a singularity, this tear in space-time. Now, uh, when you fall into a black hole, and I don't advise it, there is a maximal time you can survive for. It's roughly given by the time it takes light to travel this distance, L. Okay, so it's really not very long. Um, and the more you sort of struggle against it, actually, the shorter the time you will experience. There really is no way around it. It's a bad thing. And, and it would all end in a singularity. Now, a singularity is this sort of... A uh, tear, it's a time or a place, <coughs> is essentially where our understanding of physics breaks down. Whilst our universe is mathematical, it seems to be mathematical in the sense of numbers, but infinity doesn't seem to play any role. And so whenever we see infinities come up in our equations, it really means that we haven't understood the mathematics well enough. Something else must happen to get rid of that infinity and turn it into proper numbers. <coughs> now, General relativity also gives us cosmology, the idea that matter makes the universe expand. And whilst there are singularities inside black holes, perhaps a more relevant singularity for all of us is the singularity at the beginning of the universe. When we look back in our expanding universe, it very much seems, and I don't think uh, many people would disagree, the universe started at what we could call a singularity. It started in a region of space and time curvature which is beyond our understanding. We don't know how to describe it. And for me, from a personal point of view, that is my motivation for thinking more deeply about space and time. To understand our origins, 
it's a sobering thought in a sense that every bit of matter you're made of essentially origi originated from this singularity at the beginning of the universe, okay, when time and space were created. So it's sort of understanding it fits into this more general program uh, the human race seems to have to understand its origins and place in the universe. Now, to rock, the rock area of physics, uh, this is Jimmy. actually at the Albert Hall that he's playing, just across the road. Now, if space and time is dynamical, as we learn from Einstein, it should be governed by a quantum dynamics because we believe all dynamics in the end is quantum, as I said earlier. And I define a quantum gravity to be a theory of uh, physics with a dynamical space-time that is indeed quantum and is complete and unambiguous. Now, here's a, a sort of spoiler. I don't think, personally, we have a single theory of quantum gravity, a quantum description of space-time. I should have said, general relativity, Einstein's theory, has no h-bar. You saw no h-bar. It is a classical theory. So it is not a quantum theory. And there are many attempts at quantum gravitational theories these days but none of them are understood deeply mathematically. And in particular, none of them are understood to the point where we can say with certainty that the mathematics that we're writing down is even self-consistent. Okay? So one can ask, can we describe our universe quantum mechanically and quantum gravity? I, th I would claim, and I don't think it's unreasonable, that we're not at that stage yet. What we're trying to reveal and understand better is how to describe quantum space-time mathematically, in this language that the universe seems to be written in. And we aren't there yet. There's lots of progress, there's lots of developments, but we're not there yet. For that reason, many people study models of, our, of quantum space-time that don't even look like our universe. They, they're not a cosmology. They're not an expanding universe. They have different matter in than our universe. They have different dimensions. But the, the idea with looking at other sort of uh, realities or other models of quantum space-time is really that we want to make the mathematics as understandable as possible. So we can get to the point, at least maybe we understand one model mathematically. And then when we've understood one, we can think about uh, making it describe our universe or finding the one that describes our universe. And honestly, we don't even understand the rules. We don't know whether there's only one theory of quantum gravity in which case, perhaps it's one of the competing theories out there now, probably unlikely, if there really is only one. Maybe there are many theories of quantum gravity, in which case, which is the one that describes our universe? We don't know. So it could be that all of the approaches that people are pursuing now are indeed, in the end, mathematically consistent, or many of them, I should say, probably not all of them. Uh, many of them are mathematically consistent, in that case, probably none of them are the answer to what describes our universe, because there are probably many more that we haven't found yet. It could be that actually they're all secretly the same thing. When we understand the mathematics deeply, they're all consistent and in fact the same thing rewritten in complicated different ways. We just don't know. So it's an exciting time. There's lots of progress going on trying to understand these laws of mathematics, um, but we don't have any definite answers yet. We have some clues. We understand some things. One thing we understand, or I would claim, some people claim we don't understand this, but I think that's wrong. I think we understand this well. If we apply quantum mechanics very naively to general relativity, what we learn is that the ripples in space-time, when they become quantum and you make tiny ripples, resolve themselves into little quanta <coughs> called gravitons. This is totally an analog to the electromagnetic field whose quanta is the photon. I would claim we understand gravitons reasonably well, uh, and the theory that this combination of quantum mechanics and general relativity that describes it, we understand that framework very well, but because we understand it well, we also understand that it is not complete. It only describes reasonably tame gravitons and, and ripples in space-time quantum mechanically, and it breaks down if we consider high energies or small scales. 
We know it breaks down. It predicts its own demise. So what sort of scales are we talking about? Where, where do we have to look uh, in order to see real quantum uh, behavior, full quantum behavior and gravity? Well, we can estimate that by looking at a black hole. I already told you the size of a black hole. I hope you were taking notes, by the way. Uh, the size of a black hole looks like this. The, the horizon is governed by the mass in this way. The bigger the mass, the bigger the horizon. On the other hand, I told you that quantum fuzziness of something with a mass m goes like this. The bigger the mass, the smaller the fuzziness. So a big black hole, I can, I can gesture but not uh, talk. <laughs> a big black hole <laughs> is, not, is not very fuzzy. <laughs> and a small black hole becomes very fuzzy and very quantum. And the point at which the fuzziness is the size is what we call the quantum gravity scale. And if a little bit of algebra, uh, bit, you know, elementary algebra tells you what that scale is, we call it the Planck length because it was written down by Planck, in fact, just before 1900, remarkably. Um, and it's a tiny, tiny length scale. It's actually, when you write it out, it's at zero point, 35 zeros, and then a one, and then meters. It doesn't make much difference if you measure it in inches. It's roughly the same. And it's the scale at which we believe space and time becomes fully quantum. We can't think of it classically. We have to include quantum mechanics. Just for comparison, this is the size of an atom, the size of a proton, the smallest scale seen at CERN. Um, clearly, we're nowhere near. And uh, I don't think we're going to be anywhere near directly measuring this anytime soon. But presumably, we are all born from this cosmological singularity and the fields that make up the quantum fields that your particles are excitations of have seen this scale in the past. Another big clue came from the, the beautiful work of Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking did very, many, many very, very uh, amazing uh, things in the field of gravity, but in particular, he realized that when you include quantum mechanics into black holes, they are actually hot. Not very hot, but hot. So he looked at big black holes, which, as we just described, are not very quantum, and looked at the matter outside them, including quantum mechanics. And whilst classically matter always falls into a black hole, quantum mechanically, there's always a little bit of chance that it can escape. And so you get a quantum leakage of matter and energy out of a black hole, which in detail looks as if it's heat, thermal radiation. Now, uh, if you go to Westminster Abbey, there was a beautiful service uh, when he was, uh, his remains were interred there. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, but there's a, there's a, a, a stone above his remains uh, next to Newton, so wonderful company. Um, and on that stone is this formula, and that's his formula for the temperature of a black hole. So T is the temperature of the black hole, M is its mass, and these other things are constants you've seen before. And there's one other fundamental constant, k, uh, which I don't view as that fundamental. It's called the Boltzmann constant. I won't write it out. But the important thing is temperature and mass here. Now, for a real black hole, like uh, a black hole, the, the mass of the sun, um, that temperature would be something like a hundred millionth of a degree above absolute zero. So it's, it's impossibly small and totally unmeasurable currently. But what it implies is something tremendously profound. It implies that black holes must be made of something more fundamental. The reason being that temperature itself doesn't hold any physical character. It describes only a more fundamental system. So when we talk about a gas having a temperature, we can do that because we know it's made of something more fundamental, particles of gas, of the gas. And then the behavior of those particles if we don't follow individual particles and we sort of close our eyes and just look at the core system, the whole system, is well described by things like temperature and energy. But really, once, we've, once we know there's a notion of temperature, we're led to the fact there's a more fundamental underlying description. And the, the key point is that Hawking's calculation tells us there's a temperature and an underlying description, but it doesn't reveal what it is because it's not a quantum gravity calculation. Entropy is the quantity that characterizes this microscopic physics that underlies a thermal system. It essentially gives the number, or it measures the number of configurations of this microscopic 
uh, physics available to the system, or in physics language, the number of degrees of freedom, the sort of number of things fundamentally it's made of. So for a gas in a box, the degrees of freedom are the particles, and they can arrange themselves in different configurations with different velocities. And a basic property of entropy, or degrees of freedom, uh, in, a, in a system at least without gravity is that you take a bigger system, there's more degrees of freedom. All things being equal, the entropy scales like the volume of the system, unsurprisingly. Now, uh, Jacob Beckenstein was the first person to really calculate this entropy for a black hole, essentially using that formula for the temperature. You can deduce what the entropy looks like for a black hole, and it goes like this. It goes like the area of the horizon, A, divided by Planck length squared. So we can think of that, if we've got a black hole, divide the horizon, a sphere, up into little squares, each a Planck area in size, and count them. That's roughly, then, the number of degrees of freedom that entropy tells us a black hole has. And the important point is this is vast. It's a vast, vast number. If you look at the entropy of the sun, it's huge. It's a whopping great ball of very hot gas. However, if it formed a black hole, the entropy of the black hole it would form is vastly bigger. So this entropy is not just coming from stuff that fell in. It's something more fundamental to the black hole. Now, we move up to date. Unlike in the previous era, where you might have thought m instruments are fundamental to music, we now learn, actually, depending on your definition of music, of course, that uh, instruments are not the fundamental thing. The sound wave is the fundamental thing. And nowadays, we simply have the power to make any sound wave we like. We can do away with instruments altogether. They're not fundamental. So what we call fundamental is somewhat shifted, um, again, depending on your tastes. So. We now come on to the subject of space-time holography. Now, I am pleased to say that probably a lot of what I've said before, many people wouldn't disagree with, uh, my colleagues. Uh, what I'm going to say now, I'm certain some of my colleagues will disagree with, and that's great. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, is, a, is a function of the fact that we don't know what the answers are. But here's a perspective. In quantum gravity, the idea of space-time holography is that the most degrees of freedom that can fit into a spatial volume isn't governed by the volume at all. It's governed by the area of the boundary of that volume in Planck units. So the number of degrees of freedom goes like the area surrounding this volume in Planck units. And this was a proposal put forward by Tuft and Suskin. Tuft is a Nobel Prize winner for other reasons. And these are, these are brilliant theoretical physicists of, of our era. If we have a, a volume, the logic is simple. You might think as you try and excite all of these fundamental degrees of freedom, heating it up, um, the entropy is going to go like the volume, and it starts to, but initially as you excite more and more, in the end, you form a black hole because you put too much energy in. So in a theory of gravity, in the end, as you try and excite more and more, you're just left with a big black hole that takes up your volume. And the number of degrees of freedom in that only goes like its area, not its volume. And so this is the logic behind what we call the holographic principle, the space-time holographic principle, that a fundamental description of space-time in a theory of gravity shouldn't be thought of as living in the volume of the space-time, but rather on its boundary. Now, this does change our notion of space-time, as you can imagine, if you're not bamboozled to the point of uh, non-existence at the moment. Uh, uh, the, the fundamental point now is that the space-time in the interior is not fundamental reality in that theory. Rather, it is an emergent phenomenon. The fundamental reality of that theory lives on the boundary of the volume. Now, the reason it's called space-time holography is, of course, in analogy with the hologram. The fundamental description of a hologram is some uh, information stored on a two-dimensional photographic plate. What emerges from that plate is, of course, a 3D image, but it's not really a 3D object there at all. Um, it's just an emergent phenomenon from a more fundamental physical object. Now, we now come on to something called the ADS-CFT conjecture, which turns these words into something precise. What volume? There's lots of volumes we can, if we're not holding a microphone, draw in space and time. So which is the volume we should pick who, so that the degrees of freedom are, uh, are on its boundary? Well... Uh, some space-times, unlike ours, have a definite boundary. And one of them is called ADS space-time. 
And Juan Maldacena, who is, I think, uncontroversially, one of the uh, uh, most brilliant theoretical physicists around today, uh, proposed to look, in some sense, this isn't, isn't quite the order of events, but roughly speaking, proposed to look at a space-time like one of these. It acts like a box. So and ADS space-time can be viewed. It's got a sort of normal time, but space just stops at an edge. And inside this box, space and time is dynamical, but at the edge of the box, it's fixed. So we could put a black hole into the box, that's fine. We could have two black holes colliding, that's fine. Um, but the observation then, if you think about space-time holography, is that the fundamental description of the physics in the box, the space-time in the box, should be living on the boundary. The boundary is fixed, and therefore, this fundamental description is not a gravitational theory. There's no dynamical space-time for it. But somehow, emerging from it, is this theory in the interior. And the, the remarkable thing that Maldacena did was to identify precisely a theory of this nature. He, he deduced that if you looked on the boundary at a particular theory, the name isn't terribly important, but it sounds sort of cool, N equals four super young mills. Uh, it described a very particular theory of gravity in the interior, which he also identified. And the most remarkable thing is that this theory on the boundary, if we tried to write it down, would look almost the same schematically as the theory of the standard model. Again, it fits on a t-shirt. In fact, it would almost, you could use the same t-shirt effectively. Okay? The main difference is that the, the particles are different. The number, you can have all sorts of particles because you're not trying to reproduce the standard model. And in fact, you can change the number of particles and the number of different particles actually corresponds in the interior to what we call this Planck length. Taking lots of particles, this theory encodes remarkably this classical space-time continuum in the interior, dynamical space-time. And it needs lots of particles to do it because, of course, it's, it's sort of living in lower dimensions. How could it encode something like a continuum without having tons of degrees of freedom? However, as you crank down the number of degrees of freedom or particles in that theory, this space and time in the interior no longer looks like a continuum space-time. And actually, you can crank down the degrees of freedom a lot. It looks nothing like space-time at all and certainly no longer... I mean, it, 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 you can't be thought of as a continuous space-time anymore. It's fully quantum. Is it true? Now, this is a conjecture. Okay, it's a conjecture. It hasn't been mathematically proven, and I suspect it can't be, or at least it's, it's difficult to know what a proof would look like. But there are many checks... Um, there's, uh, there's many beautiful pen and paper calculations checking many aspects of it, and by this point, it would be very, uh, very surprising if it was wrong. However, uh, it's been very difficult with pen and paper to actually <laughs> probe the full quantum gravity regime as well. So whilst we think it's a consistent theory, we can't prove that yet, and we also can't extract all the information we want from it. We've learned some things, uh, assuming it's true, but we also, there's much more we want to learn. In particular, what this quantum space-time looks like, how it behaves. And whilst I'm not going to talk about my research, you'll probably be very pleased, I'm almost at the end, uh, but um, what one of the things I focused on over around uh, 10 to 15 years or so, um, <laughs> I lose track, <laughs> sadly, uh, is using computers rather than pen and paper methods to try and understand and test this conjecture. And in fact, some time ago, uh, myself and uh, a physicist called Simon Catterall, and at, at roughly the same time, a group in Japan, for the first time, tried to put these sort of theories on a computer, heat them up, and see if the physics that emerges is the physics of a hot space-time, meaning is the physics of black holes. Uh, and, and that program has gone on. There's more and more groups involved in it these days, and it really seems to be true. It's rather remarkable, but nonetheless, it's true. We don't understand the maths, but it's a, it's a powerful check, and it, and it seems to all work. Now, what about our universe? Now, this obviously doesn't describe our universe. As I said, we're trying to get mathematical consistency at the moment. Maybe it's too soon to describe our universe, but it's probably worth saying a few words. The obvious question is, where's the boundary? In fact, the presence of dark energy is very interesting. Dark energy is very mysterious. If anyone comes up to you and says, I know what dark energy is, uh, they probably haven't thought about it enough. I, I would suggest that no one knows what dark energy fundamentally is. And one of the things it does suggest 
is actually there are two notions of nat naturally of boundaries in our universe. One is at the far reaches of the universe, what we call the horizon, the event horizon. And the other is the far future of the universe, which uh, emerges when you have dark energy. And perhaps, probably not, but perhaps the space and time that you see in front of you now that you think you're occupying, this wonderful continuous uh, thing, is actually not there at all and really is encoded in some fundamental way, maybe to your far future, the far future of the whole universe, or maybe far away in the distant reaches of the universe. And luckily, there's lots of degrees of freedom, so you don't have to worry about it not being too continuous. Um, anyway, to summarize, space and time began as an absolute uh, continuum. They didn't begin, I mean, by that, I mean our understanding of the began that way. Uh, space time is promoted to a dynamical entity by general relativity, how we perceive it depends on our motion and is limited by quantum mechanics. Um, but in particular, in a theory of gravity at a fundamental level, this notion of a space-time continuum, dynamical or not, may simply not be fundamental reality at all. And space and time may look very, very different. They're, they're simply emergent. They don't exist. The fundamental description may be very, very strange to us. Anyway, I will end there. Thank you. I'm going to, before I hand over to Gary to give the vote of thanks, we were going to have a bit of time for questions, but I noticed that Toby has actually taken us right through to the end of the session, and I'm not going to let you get away with it. <laughs> Do we have anyone who has any urgent questions that they would like to ask Toby? She says not being able to see at all. Yes, there's a gentleman. Oh, we, we have a mic at the back of the room. Sorry we had such problems with the mic. Um, it was interesting to see you try and <laughs> use both hands. <laughs> yes, it's this, this gentleman here. You pass the microphone. Is this, this <laughs> one? <laughs> you referred to dark, sorry. You <laughs> referred to dark energy towards the end of your talk. Uh, what about dark matter? Is that easier to understand? or? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. So, uh, this... Th very possibly, dark matter is um, just a f another particle we haven't uh, managed to detect because it, it interacts too weakly for us to detect. And it's, it's perfectly reasonable for that to be the case. However, uh, on account of who's standing near me, <laughs> or sitting near me, two of my wonderful colleagues here, uh, I should say that there's another possibility, which is that actually dark matter is a reflection of our ignorance of gravity on large scales. And so it probably isn't a quantum phenomenon, but it may well be that Einstein's equations perhaps don't apply on large scales in ways that we don't understand. And maybe there's some other law of gravitation on those scales, and this has certainly been proposed in, in, in all sorts of uh, varieties that perhaps could explain the behavior of dark matter. It's difficult because dark matter increasingly is seen really to act like some sort of local matter. But we don't really know. And one of the things I've always, you know, I started off in cosmology. Cosmology is a funny subject. We understand an awful lot about cosmology, certain aspects, and there's all sorts of aspects that we have no clue about. And in particular, understanding the expansion of the universe today, which you would think would be a basic thing that you could understand in cosmology before you move on to more complicated things, is really the thing we don't understand. To explain it, we need dark matter and dark energy, both of which are somewhat mysterious, dark energy particularly. And I've always found that rather striking, that uh, the most basic questions in cosmology, fundamentally, we don't really understand very well. But if we want to look at very detailed things like the cosmic microwave background, in fact, it seems that many aspects of that we understand uh, extremely well. So there's lots of room for surprises, uh, but dark energy has a, a, quite a different nature than dark matter. And dark matter could be something relatively boring, and I uh, use that advisedly. I mean, it's very interesting, but uh, from a, yeah, nothing we can't understand using existing physics. 
One more, if we can see one. Oh, yes, there we go. Yeah, thank you. Um, why do you think there's a preference amongst cosmologists to assume that the universe is finite? You, you seem to be among their number, if I understand you correctly. It could be expanding, or indeed contracting, and infinite. Um, so, yeah. So when I was um, when I was growing up, people argued about whether the universe was finite in extent or infinite in spatial extent, and would be finite in time or infinite in time. Uh, and that was sort of what they argued about. And then they discovered dark energy. Um, and also understood uh, it, the, it, the predictions of inflation became better. And then you're naturally led to infinitely, uh, a sort of infinite life of the universe in terms of its length from now on. And that if it is finite in size, it's somewhat irrelevant to us because whilst it may have been finite in the past, it's been blown up so much that from our perspective now, we'll never see a hint of that finiteness. So all we can see is the, you know, the, the point about the universe, you know, we don't think of it this way. It's not very old. It's very, very big, but it's not very old. It's only 14 billion years old, which is disappointingly young. Okay? I mean, we've, you know, Earth has been around something like 5 billion years, so it's been around most of that time. Life developed pretty soon after the Earth formed you know, relatively speaking. So the universe is really not very old, and light has only managed to travel for 14 billion years, and so the furthest we can see is 14 billion light years away, which really is not very far. It's, it's extremely likely that if the universe is finite, it's, it's vastly bigger than what we can see, to the point where it's, a, it's somewhat irrelevant to us. Uh, but of course, maybe, maybe we'll learn by thinking about quantum gravity what the constraints are on whether it's really infinite or whether it has to be finite. It's precisely that by thinking probably about these more fundamental questions that we might learn about that. Okay, thank you very much. May I hand over to Gary Horowitz, who is going to give us the vote of thanks. Gary, please. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and to say a few words about Toby. I've known Toby for about 15 years now and have enormous respect for him. He has all the qualities I really like to see in a physicist. He's brilliant, creative, and a really nice person. <laughs> I first met Toby about the mid-2000s when he came to my home institution, the University of California at Santa Barbara, um, for a workshop. Um, but by that time, he had already had a big impact on me. In 2001, I was studying a problem involving black holes in more than three spatial dimensions. Now, physicists sometimes like to think that space has more than three dimensions because it helps us to unify all the different forces uh, that we see in nature. And the reason why we don't see more than three dimensions can be explained in, in a couple of ways, uh, one being just that this extra dimension might be more like a circle curled up on itself and not infinite. And if the circle is small enough, well, you would need very high energy to resolve uh, points in it. Well, if you imagine more than three dimensions, then black holes can um, become something we call a black string. It's a black, ho it's a black hole like object whose surface looks more like a cylinder that, than a sphere. And I was thinking about these um, black strings. It had been known for a while that they were unstable. The black strings that were known were all very uniform. They were straight. Uh, the surface of the black hole looked the same anywhere you looked. But there was an instability, which made this sort of cylinder type object get fatter in some region and skinnier in other regions. And this instability, some people thought, meant that the black string with its cylinder type surface would break up into more ordinary looking uh, black holes, which are spherical, look like little balls. Um, but I did some calculations which led me to believe that that wasn't the case, that this instability would settle down to something which was not uniform, but there would be a solution with a black string fatter in some region and thinner in other regions. Well, no solutions were known like that, but it sort of seemed like that had to be the case, so I wrote a paper and made the prediction. A year later, I saw a paper 
by a young physicist just out of a PhD named Toby Wiseman, who numerically constructed exactly solutions of this type. He had found solutions of Einstein's equation which described these non-uniform or lumpy uh, black strings. Well, um, and this paper had only a single author. So this was work he had done entirely by himself. Well, this impressed me enormously, but the paper had a surprise. In addition to finding these solutions, Toby showed that they could not be the endpoint of the instability of this black string. Because Hawking had shown that the area of a black hole must always increase. And he showed that the solutions he found had an area which was smaller than the original straight black string that people knew about before. So he found that these solutions I thought existed really do exist, but they played no role at all in the instability of the black string. Now, more important than finding this solution, Toby's paper introduced a powerful new tool for finding large classes of solutions of Einstein's equation. And this tool has been generalized and applied in many, many directions uh, since that time. And this has become a general feature of Toby's work. He not only solves hard problems, but he introduces powerful new tools which allow us to solve many more hard problems. When I finally met Toby uh, a few years later, he came to a workshop in Santa Barbara, he was in great demand because many people had problems that required solving complicated uh, differential equations, and Toby was the only one who knew how to do it. Uh, and he remember him telling me at the time that he had to be very selective in who he um, agreed to help because even though he knew in principle how to solve these problems, each one might take him up to six months of work to find the solution. Um, okay, let me mention another important problem that Toby solved um, about 10 years ago. It's, he solved the problem that had been open for 10 years. So there is another way of um, resolving. If you imagine space has more than three dimensions, uh, you could uh, assume, well, explain why we don't see the extra dimension by postulating that maybe we are confined to live on a certain three-dimensional surface in this higher dimensional space. Um, and that had been discussed. The surface is like a membrane, and so these theories are called brain world theories. And somebody had said that in a brain world theory, you couldn't have large black holes that would just sit there and not change. And so that conjecture had been made around 2000, for 10 years, people tried to construct numerically uh, black holes, large black holes in these brain world uh, theories and not found any. So there was some growing consensus, maybe this conjecture was right and they didn't exist. Well, 2011, Toby writes a paper introducing again new numerical methods and constructs large black holes in a brain world, showing in fact that they do exist. Now, Toby is not only an outstanding numerical physicist, he has really keen insight. And I remember a paper from five years ago where he was discussing um, what he mentioned at the end of his talk, this ADS-CFT conjecture, um, in which there's a non-gravitational theory which is supposed to be describing gravity. And people had been using properties of black holes to deduce properties of this uh, non-gravitational theory um, and there were complicated properties of the theory that you could deduce assuming this black hole description. But in this paper that Toby wrote five years ago, he found very clever intuitive arguments for explaining many of these properties directly in the language of this non-gravitational theory and explaining how you can understand those properties without using gravity and without using any numerics. Now I can't stress enough how rare it is to find somebody who is not only an outstanding numerical physicist and also has this keen insight. Um, he really is quite uh, unique. And it's, you're enormously um, privileged to have him on your faculty uh, here at Imperial. So you might think that somebody with so much talent would like to lord it over people and become really difficult to be around. <laughs> <laughs> but nothing could be farther from the truth. I mean, he's just an incredibly uh, considerate person 
Um, I arrived in London this past weekend, and Toby is constantly uh, you know, asking if he can do anything to make my visit more comfortable and uh, things. And he even offered to drive an hour out of his way uh, to pick me up and take me someplace I had to go um, so I wouldn't have to use the underground. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe he thought I'd get lost or something. But uh, of course, I refused. Um, now, in addition to his research, Toby's done an enormous service to the community by organizing half a dozen international conferences. And I remember one that he held here in Imperial 10 years ago on black holes in more than three uh, spatial dimensions. I was here at this meeting and very impressed with all the progress that had been made in understanding these new types of black holes. So I decided to edit a book on these higher dimensional black holes. And I have to tell you, this is the easiest way to get a book published with your name on the cover. Because Toby had invited all of the key people in the field, all the people who had made the most important contributions to the subject. So I just went around and asked each one if they would write a chapter for my book. <laughs> uh, Toby himself wrote a chapter on finding solutions of Einstein's equation numerically. And I had the pleasure of co-writing a chapter with Toby on what these black holes looked like if space had four dimensions and the dimension was curled up in a little circle. Toby even contributed the artwork for the cover because he, uh, he had this picture of a black hole turning into a black string or a black string splitting up into black holes, which was just, just beautiful. So let me just close by repeating what I said earlier. Toby is an incredibly talented um, uh, physicist and you are really fortunate to have him on your faculty here at Imperial. Thank you. Just to give Toby a little bit of time to recover from the blushing that he's been doing down at the front here. Um, before we end, and we thank Toby once again for a fantastic uh, discovery tour of what he's worked on. Um, there are going to be two separate receptions taking place, one of them outside on level two and the other one up on level eight. I'm so sorry we've had to split the receptions, but we were recently told that our level eight room can't have more than 60 people in it for health and safety reasons, and we've been using it for years for many more than that. But um, <laughs> we thought we should behave, so I think Toby is going to stay for a little while at, on the level two reception before he goes up to level eight. But please join me in thanking Toby for a fantastic lecture.